take this opportunity to welcome and thank all our dignitaries. Mr. Rajesh Segal, Managing Partner at Equanimity Investments, Mumbai. Mr. NMD Shinoy, Director and CEO, Best Fit Business Solution, Private Limited. Dr. Usha Nair Raikart, PhD, School of Economics, Georgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta. Mr. Anil Talreja, Deloitte Haskins and Sells, LLP, Mumbai. We welcome you all. This evening's session is chaired by our very own faculty member, Dr. Bhargavi, Associate Professor, Department of Economics, KJ Somaya Institute of Management. Ma'am is the Master's in Economics from Madras University and PhD from SNDT Women's University. She has an experience of 14 years in the teaching line. Her research revolves around India's foreign direct investments and the internationalization strategies adopted by India and other eco emerging e economies. We would like to invite, invite ma'am to kindly deliver opening remarks and set the context. Thank you. A very warm welcome to our eminent panelists, department colleagues, and my dear student community as we approach uh, the last session of our today economics conference. I'm here to set the context to today's session on uh, the geopolitical issues in current global business, or as I would like to call it, the geopolitics of COVID-19. I wish to call this geopolitics of COVID-19 because uh, pandemics are inherently geopolitical. And they involve issues such as national security, global leadership, international cooperation, and competition. While 2020 was the year COVID-19 took the world by storm, 2021 will be when the pandemic's medium to long-term effects on the geopolitical environment will begin to crystallize. We are all aware of how COVID-19 in many countries has exacerbated tensions around economic inequality, access to healthcare, and social justice. Well, I don't have any PPTs as such to share. Uh, I shall be deliberating upon uh, some key eight to nine salient uh, geopolitical uh, trends that have emerged and as we all know, uh, the geopolitical trends is a developing story. So, in sync with the reality, uppermost to one's mind is vaccine nationalism. We all know the across all countries, the vaccination drive is very active with over 50 vaccines in various stages of clinical trials. And very clearly, which country gets vaccine to their citizens first will be the key and will help determine what the geopolitical implications of winning the vaccine race will be. The second important trend that I see is the emergence of new regionalism, which is gaining momentum. Increasingly across uh, world economies, there has been an unleashing of strong anti-globalization sentiments, and there has been a shift towards rising regionalization of economic and political systems. People world over are embracing bi-national attitudes, which is very much in sync with India's own Atmanirbhar program. Another trend that is uh, gaining prominence is the re-evaluation of supply chains. The pandemic undermines the need to reevaluate the supply chains. Even before the pandemic, a rise in protectionism in some markets had led companies to consider reshoring and offshore and nearshoring supply chains. And the government's response to COVID-19 by further restricting cross-border trade exposed companies to the risk of long international supply chains, particularly when the dependency was on a single region or country. One foresees that the supply chain for essential uh, goods, such as food, medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, will continue to remain incredibly vulnerable. 
Therefore, a diversification of supply chains with a mix of local, nearshore, and global strategies is likely to persist. The fourth important trend, how can we miss out the geopolitics of technology and data? Technology has become central to geopolitical, geopolitical competition, a trend that has been accelerated by COVID-19 as more aspects of work and life have moved online. Governments are intervening to build domestic capabilities while also inhibiting foreign competitors' influence or access. We are all aware of uh, the tensions in 2020 when US put pressure on Chinese companies in 5G, semiconductors, AI algorithms, and other strategic technologies. One sees the European Union and China taking steps to become more self-sufficient in key digital technologies through their digital sovereignty and dual circulation policies. A clear aftermath of the rapid escalation of social and business activities online has been the creation of an environment extremely vulnerable to disinformation campaigns and cyber attacks. Finally, COVID-19 has ensured that biosecurity becomes a strategic defense and economic interest. It will therefore join the ranks of 5G, AI, and other fourth industrial revolution technologies in accelerating geopolitical technological competition. Another interesting facet is demographics. The way aging is catalyzing global rebalancing. The geopolitics of the pandemic has accentuated, has accentuated societal, economic, and policy implications of aging. Because at the end of the day, a country's demographic profile helps shape the operational and cost burdens of the outbreak. What do I mean by that? For older societies, the outbreak has meant facing a higher human and economic toll from the disease, as we saw earlier on in countries like Italy, Spain, and perhaps a slower economic recovery. For nations like us, like ours, with young populations, it has meant to encounter higher unemployment, economic dislocations, and larger social upheaval. I think the aftermath, the most critical, glaring, and painful uh, aftermath of a uh, trend of social upheaval has been inequality. If you were wealthier, it would be easy for you to implement some physical distancing. Older people susceptible to COVID-19 could isolate themselves better when they had an existing support system and sufficient incomes. We saw in the case of the United States how mortality rates were sharper and higher in the case of some ethnic minority communities. The ghastly images of tens of thousands of migrants marching back to their villages is very vivid in the case of India. It went on to show how, depend how people dependent on daily wages or the informal sector were far less able to survive the pandemic. Relief packages, clearly across the world, had to be pushed out through existing social security and welfare channels. Of critical importance in the geopolitical stage is the disentangling of US-China interdependence. US-China interrelationship, we all know, has soured on several fronts throughout 2020. US had expanded export controls, prescribed entity lists, explored restriction on Chinese companies accessing US financial markets, sought to ban certain Chinese social media companies, and further restricted Chinese companies in the telecommunications and semiconductors industry. 
China and US will continue to try to disentangle the strategic interdependence in 2021, with the Biden administration likely to perpetuate many of the policies pursued under Trump. Bilateral tariffs will remain in effect, although one expects the Biden administration to reduce tariffs or increase exclusions if doing so would support US economic growth. What's the case of European Union? Well, in a world of rising geopolitical tensions between global powers, the European Union is seeking to define its place and role. On the foreign policy front, the European Union will seek to define a common and coherent approach to China, which the EU, e European Union recognizes as a systemic rival, an economic competitor, while also being a cooperative partner. So reaching an agreement on the European Union-China Comprehensive Agreement on Investment will be of topmost priority to create a fair market competition and investor access. To sum it up, the three leading geopolitical powers, US, EU, China, will compete for greater self-reliance, particularly in digital technologies. Great power politics is out there to play in 2021. Coming to climate policy agendas, global CO2 emissions are expected to drop. We had a wonderful paper uh, yesterday evening uh, on, on CO2 emissions. So the glo global CO2 emissions are expected to drop by 4% to 7% in 2020, uh, owing to the lockdowns and reduction in air travels. Countries such as Brazil and US have pushed environmental degrading policies in recent years, while markets like the European Union and South Korea have uh, enacted plans for carbon neutrality by 2050. China, the world's largest emitter of greenhouse gases, recently pledged, pledged to be carbon neutral by 20, 2060. China's recent carbon neutrality pledge may raise the bar for emerging other emerging markets, most notably India, where uh, carbon neutrality is still nascent. Beijing's moves could also put pressure on Australia and US, the world's second largest emitter, to do more to tackle climate change and improve their competitiveness in green, in green companies or industries. Let's take a look at uh, the emerging market debt. The sustainability of emerging market, emerging market de debt is likely to hit a tipping point in 2021 as more governments seek debt relief or enter default. The International Monetary Fund forecasts that emerging and frontier market government debt will rise to 64% of GDP in 2021, up from 52% in 2019. Geopolitical considerations will also influence multilateral and bilateral debt restructuring to a great degree, greater degree than in the past. China is the largest creditor to many emerging and frontier markets. So its willingness to restructure the debts of cash-trapped countries will be very critical. These being the highlights of the geopolitical trends, I invite the eminent speakers of today to take center stage and take the session forward. Thank you, one and all. Thank you, ma'am, for guiding us through the topic and setting the context for the evening. We Pass now up. present before you our first expert of the session, Mr. Rajesh Segal, managing partner Equanimity Investments, Mumbai. Mr. Rajesh is an active member of Mumbai Angels and is also the founding and current chair of the Corporate Reporting Users Forum, a global forum. Well, he is an active TIE charter member and is the co-chair of the FinTech Special Interest Group at TIE Mumbai. We invite you to share your experience on the topic of technology disruptions on global business models. Uh, thanks for this. I hope I'm audible and you guys can see me. 
yes, sir. So this was uh, so thanks, thanks. So this was, I think, very uh, uh, you know, well set uh, backdrop to the conversation we all are going to have today. And I'm going to make an effort to uh, share with you my thoughts on uh, on technology in this option and uh, business models. You know what happens globally, uh, what's likely to uh, happen, what's likely to how it's likely to pan out. Uh, you know, I have a I have a very uh, this is a topic which is very close to my heart. Uh, it's because I run uh, a fund and we invest from that fund into early stage companies. And the kind of companies we seek to invest in are companies that are using technology to disrupt the markets that they're working in, in a very sustainable manner. And at the same time, making sure that they are, uh, you know, setting up a scalable business. So, uh, so I'll just share with you uh, today my thoughts on uh, what we've seen globally, why we think that works, what about it doesn't work, and how that can be replicated in India. So let me start by, uh, you know, just talking a little bit about disruption and then about business models. And then at the, towards the end of the conversation, we'll try to link the two. So eliminating, eliminating barriers to value is what disrupts and upends old business models. And new technology, as we have seen, uh, you know, in real life, uh, new technology excels at doing this. There are, uh, you know, tons and tons of examples out there of this happening right in front of our eyes. Uh, as much as this has been happening since uh, technology really came into its own in the 80s and 90s in the US and other developed markets. Um, technology, as we know, has, uh, you know, more or less revolutionized not only our lives, uh, you know, in the longer run, but also on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a great example of that is this call itself, you know, pandemic or no pandemic, we are having these conferences, ideas are being shared, people are seeing each other, meeting each other, talking to each other. Uh, we've seen uh, financial transactions, you know, all of us do it very seamlessly online using technology. We've seen healthcare take advantage of technology and, uh, you know, uh, we are not able to hospitalize people using technology yet, uh, but a lot of uh, consultation, a lot of uh, medication uh, for, uh, for human beings, pets, etc. is now all getting done online. So it's just, uh, uh, you know, the way technology has uh, engulfed our lives is is something which is which is amazing and what we are going to do now uh, you know delve a little deeper into is how technology has delved into the lives of businesses and business leaders uh, so you know uh, considering that competition among companies will not only happen through new products services or technologies but also through innovative business models uh, and that's the uh, you know area of focus today uh, disruptive business models uh, arise all the time and they replace existing business models, adopting the organizational structures to the products and services offered and emphasizing the proposition of unique value. Uh, you know, so, so disruption is a very loosely used word. What I'm going to do is try to put a little structure around it uh, and, and try to share how we at Equanimity see disruption uh, in, in different buckets. So disruption can adopt various uh, uh, shapes and forms. One of them, which you know, all of us are very uh, familiar with is technological di disruption. Now, this kind of disruption happens when, uh, when technology is the sole reason for disrupting an existing business or a business model. Uh, for example, digital watches right, and cameras, they used electronics technology that was far superior than the mechanized winding up watches that we, that we used to have. Um, I don't know how many of us on this call today uh, even use uh, a watch that needs to be, you know, mechanically wound. Very few of us. Uh, the other kind of, uh, you know, another example uh, of this uh, is uh, is is uh, so so technology is one side. The other side is architecture. Now, why I distinguish between the two? Actually, there's a very thin line between the two, but I'm going to distinguish them by saying that. A lot of business models have been disrupted because of the architecture of the product or the service itself. A great example of this is, uh, you know, was the Sony Walkman. I don't know how many of you are aware of uh, what a Walkman was, uh, you know, because now that itself has been disrupted. So we'll come to that and, and, and see how the cycle of disruption plays itself out. So Sony Walkman was a great example of, uh, of uh, architectural disruption because what the Walkman did was it did not invent any new technology. It, what it essentially did was it took a whole new architecture and that shrank the existing available music, which at the, in, you know, in those years used to be uh, cassettes or, uh, or uh, records, you know, long playing LP records. And it just shrank all of that music 
and allowed you to carry that music with you so the whole architecture of how you how you carried music with you or how you consume music completely changed so this was another kind of disruption which came from not just technology but also an architectural change uh another another way of looking at uh, at at uh, changes and disruption is uh, the disruption in business models itself right we are all familiar with uh, with airbnb it's a great example of how existing technology was used and and that was used to create very efficient uh, you know in, uh, to create market efficiencies uh, and that redefined the whole market itself and the value proposition to the to the customer to the buyer uh we will be discussing uh, you know uh, business model disruptions in detail a little later because that is the topic of of today you know uh, business models and technological disruptions uh disruption of course can happen when there are new markets for example uh, word processors you know i don't know how many of us even get through a single day without using the word processor either it is to write documents read documents or to write emails right we all use some kind of a word processor to do that uh so word processors without which most of us can't go through a normal day uh it disrupted the entire typewriter industry which used to be a large industry you know before that uh henry ford we all know uh, you know invented the automobile so his invention of the automobile disrupted the horse drawn carriages before that so the way of uh, commuting from place a to place b in those years used to be horse drawn carriages and that is you know completely disrupted Uh, a, a simple example, uh, uh, which you know all of us can relate to, rather than look into history, is the invention uh, of uh, smartphones. Right? When smartphones uh, when smartphones came about, they disrupted a variety of industries. For example, maps. Right? There are no mapping businesses now. Uh, cameras. Uh, the smartphone. Everybody has access to cameras, so it's not only created a place for itself. The smartphone. but it is also forced changes down the camera industry the mapping industry watches i mean we all have uh, time on the phone right and and a host of other industries were disrupted when the smartphone came into its own a few years back uh now, now these were product and products and services kind of uh, disruption another angle and another way to see disruption is uh, is in our view uh, customer experience we uh, i presume all of us have used amazon one time or the other and i think uh, amazon is a great example of how customer experience has caused disruption in so many industries right and this list can go on and on and on and we'll discuss amazon a little bit later um this list as i said is a long list as technology has found a way of pervading our lives in ways we couldn't have even imagined uh, even uh, you know just a few decades ago now in addition to uh, disrupting uh, you know technology being used to disrupt uh, products and services uh, business leaders today need to be concerned with the adequacy of their business model itself and they need to be concerned about the business model in relation to new technologies that keep coming in you know no longer uh, you know even if you go like 10 20 years back there used to be a ceo business leader and then he would rely on the it team to do whatever it did i think that is completely changed in today's day and era in today's world the ceo has to understand how technology is rapidly progressing in their industry in their business and how they can leverage it to deliver better services better products uh, to their customers to ensure that they don't get disrupted right and and uh, and we'll touch upon this aspect of of uh, uh, you know technology's impact later on or you know in terms of what old businesses or existing businesses we call them incumbents how incumbents uh, you know are are being challenged so severely and so strongly and what are they doing or what can they do to really remain relevant yeah mm. now now when business leaders have to get involved because recognizing the possibilities or threats of new technologies introduced in the market for the business model that they are working on it allows them to react by realigning its products or services processes skills and you know logical forms of profit uh, and value network relationships as the essence of the business model right so so as i said business leaders are getting more and more involved with the with what technology uh, you know is doing in itself and how that can be used to maintain the profit pool that that particular company business or industry is has has been has been con has been cornering 
uh, business model innovation doesn't have to follow any massive shift in technology by the way uh, or there that it doesn't have to follow any new inventions it business model innovation can happen in any industry where the traditional model has become inefficient or the traditional model is leaving behind uh, potential customers out right um, and and again amazon is a great example of that right but before we go there let's 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 look at certain different industries and how technological disruption has played such a significant role in changing those business models completely and i think a simple example and some of it was discussed yesterday on on some other uh, discussion as well a simple example is uber right uber did actually nothing new it met the old need of moving you from point a to point b but it did so in a in a far efficient manner right it completely appended the regular car, uh, car companies cab companies taxi companies independent drivers and and their business models right now let's remember that despite all the shortcomings of the old models the cab companies the independent taxi drivers they were actually doing a pretty good job of of moving you from a to b right it had its shortcomings but but it wasn't something that was broken now it's just that the use of technology like for example ease of payments you know when you use a car you can just make an online payment immediately right at the, at the point uh, because of gps technology uh, you know becoming better and better you have pinpoint location of where the customer is standing where the car is standing how much time is it going to take uh, you know what's going to be the approximate uh, traffic along the way all of this has been uh, been aided by technology so so and that is what uber capitalized on right Uh, so all of this makes the customer experience much more smoother and pleasant right and therefore it it's impacted all of us in such a way that there's a whole term that has been coined called uberization and every ceo around you know is is always fearful of you know whether his business or his his company is going to be uberized uh, another good example you know again something that we all use and are familiar with uh, netflix netflix did something very similar by the way uh instead of uh, in the earlier years you know the traditional business model was there was a video store and you would go to the video store uh, get your video that you want to watch watch it and then return it to the store right and and there were so many stores around uh in india in india for us uh, at least in the cities that model had just about started and there were local video stores but in other markets for example in the us there was this very large company uh, called blockbuster i don't know if you are all familiar with them but blockbuster was pretty big and they had i think nearly 9 10000 stores uh you know before they went bust and and this was about 2004 2003 somewhere somewhere in those years uh now what netflix did at that time you know it didn't have streaming uh, uh, movie it wasn't streaming movies at that time because technology didn't allow so the innovation that that netflix did was they said you don't have to go to go to the store there's this internet thing that's come around so we're going to put a list of movies that we have online all you have to do is go online right log in select the movie you want to see and we will deliver that movie to you through normal mail by the way so they are, they are used normal mail right the us post etc to deliver the movie to you and after you watch the movie you could deliver that movie back send the movie back using mail so there was no no online consumption of movie it was just doing what blockbuster was doing but in a in a far more efficient manner right i'm not sure if you if you recall but netflix uh, you know what was the usp that netflix offered at that time was that there were no delay charges so so when you borrowed a movie from blockbuster and you you had to go and return it yourself and as people are there would always be delays you know you would delay it by a day two days you know i have something else to do i can't go today to give the uh, video back etc and they would charge you for those delays in fact they would charge you exorbitantly so the revenue model of blockbuster was actually deriving a lot of revenue from these delays now what did netflix do it said no delay payments no delay charges right you you watch the movie when you're done with it just send it back to us using mail and you don't have to pay for the mail we'll pay for the mail so these were the innovations that netflix actually came up with now whatever they were doing then they actually had the internal processes structures etc to disrupt whatever they were doing themselves because they that they capitalize on the new technology that came around and as we all know today netflix streams movies online 
right? They don't send you a video. Uh, so, so, so this is convenience redefined, as they say. Another example, very close to Netflix, is the music industry itself. You know, there used to be record stores. So, like you had these blockbuster kind of video stores. Before that, there used to be record stores. Uh, you know, like Circuit City in the US, or I don't know how many of us are from Mumbai, but there used to be the store in South Bombay called Rhythm House. And we would go there and buy records to listen to music. Uh, so the record stores, they are downfall, downfall and emergence of various types of digital file sharing services. Most of us would have used them sometime, you know, maybe 10 years back. And then digital distribution platforms came, came around like Napster, iTunes, right? I mean, I'm sure we're all using that in one form or the other. And, and, and that's not all. Even after Napster and iTunes happened, there's now a prevalence of streaming services like Spotify and uh, Pandora. And I'm sure most of us will be customers of these businesses in one form or the other. So the on-demand music streaming industry has had a lot of impact, not only on the record stores like Rhythm House, et cetera, but it has had an impact on retailers. It's changed the business model of musicians, right? the record labels, the producers of music, and it has changed how we, you and I consume music. So this is a good example of how technology has evolved itself and how business models have evolved along with technology to keep pace with those changes. Um, one more simple example, uh, you know, uh, I'll share with you uh, is Amazon. We all use, as I said earlier, you know, one time or the other, we all used Amazon. Now, the, the Amazon story before Amazon, there was a company in the US called Sears and they dominated retail for decades, right? Actually, they must have dominated retail in the U.S. for a major part of the last century. Uh, and then as sales grew bigger and bigger, there came a, a new company, a new competitor called uh, Walmart. right? And uh, what did Walmart do different than sales? So only one thing, they adopted technology. right? They adopted technology and they innovated the supply chain. Now, what happened when they adopted technology and innovated the supply chain? They, you know, they delivered a very good experience, a very different experience to their customers because the whole backend supply chain was so you could you could have more number of SKUs available most of the time, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what happened to Walmart? It gave uh, you know Amazon, uh, you know, a, a new place to compete with with Walmart because when Amazon came in, technology had started you know getting getting more evolved. So what did Amazon do? Amazon said, I'm not going to innovate only the supply chain. Let me innovate the entire customer experience, right? Because technology allows me to. For example, uh, you know, again, I presume uh, most of us will be, will be customers, customers of Amazon Prime. So Amazon Prime came, came to the market with the promise of a two-day delivery in the US, right? And now they're doing it in India and globally. When they did that, it was, it was, completely impossible for anyone to have two day deliveries and and make money on it now how do you make money by delivering you maybe a toothpaste within two days right and the price point of the toothpaste being what it is it's 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 virtually impossible to make money but there was this whole belief that amazon had that as they adopt more and more technology as they get more and more scale it will become profitable. And, you know, we all seen how Amazon has grown and, and the profits that, that it's making, not only in the retail online business, but also in edges and businesses like cloud services, et cetera. Uh, and, and, I mean, you know, we all know uh, Jeff Bezos, we would have heard of him, we would have seen him, et cetera. He lives by a very simple belief, uh, you know, which is customers are always beautifully, wonderfully dissatisfied. And I think that's part of the Amazon uh, DNA. What they essentially do is, keep giving you better and better experience. And if they do that, you keep buying more and more. I mean, you and I, for example, over the last few years, if we go and look at our Amazon purchases, you know, a year back, two years back, three years back, five years back, you will see that you become a larger and larger customer of Amazon. Why? Because they deliver, right? They give you that, that customer satisfaction. Uh, and that, that has appended a lot of uh, business models for a lot of companies across industries, by the way. Uh, in, in retail, in software, grocery stores, healthcare, finance, Amazon is all across. Uh, anyway, there are, there are multiple examples. I can keep going on and on and on. Uh, you know, some, the subject is so close to my heart, but, but let's say, uh, you know, let, let, let's, let's just uh, conclude this by saying uh, technology has evolved. Technology will keep evolving. Business models 
will evolve and if you you as a business leader are unable to evolve your business model your business model will get disrupted because somebody else will come up with a better one right? and that, therein lies uh, the challenge um, in all these examples uh, uh, you know that we discussed technology removed uh, some existing constraints somewhere and delivered what the customer desired very seamlessly and therefore created value for the customer and value for the company and this i think in a nutshell is what technological disruption is all about right if you are a newcomer in any industry or any business technology's capability of eliminating constraints is what you are going to play on if you are in an established industry and or business this is exactly what you need to watch out for because newcomers are trying to gain customers by tearing into parts of your businesses which are not robust right uh, if we simplify things let's just say disruptive technologies and innovations bring in simpler more convenient and more affordable products and services right uh, how do they do that they typically will lower cost and offer you know obviously they'll get lower profit margins because they are now playing on scale right and by doing any one of these or a combination they are successful in creating new markets right while they do that they also cause the failure of dominant companies in those existing markets right and what they certainly do is they generate competitive advantage that lasts and if it doesn't last so like a netflix if they don't evolve themselves right what they did to blockbuster somebody else is going to do to netflix right in fact if you are following that that industry and that sector and and the technological development in there the biggest question investors have for netflix today is that you are now so big you are where blockbuster was you are doing exactly what blockbuster was doing only in an, in an online format so can you be disrupted and where is the disruption going to come from and it's not just investors by the way netflix is you know itself asking the question you know all the time uh, it's one of the frequently asked questions on investor calls also uh, the last section of my conversation today let's take a uh, you know for that let's take a step back and uh, very interestingly look at past behemoths the giants of the past and how these uh, you know these large goliaths uh, weren't able to stand against their respective davids right the smaller newer ones who came and just defeated and you know uh, eliminated most of these guys so in the past many large corporates were built on the back of new technologies uh, at&t is a great example it was built on the back of telephone general motors another large behemoth based uh, you know uh, their business grew on the back of internal combustion engines intel we all know intel i mean they grew on the back of the computer chip for companies like these uh, business models evolved very naturally because it just meant make more of it sell more of it and make more money out of it very simple business model right nowadays companies can't rely solely on some proprietary technology because many tech companies are turning to newer business models to deliver products and manage costs to build a long lasting business and that's very very important google did just that by coming up with paid search facebook came up with ad technologies right salesforce you know i'm sure some of our us in our organizations use uh, products like these salesforce uh, with a cloud based subscription service in the place of a on premise large software installation right uh, slack i don't know how many of us use slack but slack has transformed how we work right it allows teams to make better decisions it allows cheaper communication between teams and of course it you know gives you less stress uh so this begs the question that you know these these large giants why did they not succeed why did they not see disruption coming why did they not why were they not able to prevent disruption from happening most business leaders are grappling with these uh, quintessential challenges uh, what can be better than what we are today you know it's a very it's a very simple question but such a difficult question for a business leader that i am doing something i am the market leader i am a giant company huge balance sheet huge uh, market everything you know great goodwill nice brand everything and i am profitable but my job as a ceo now is also to think okay how can i dis- destroy this and do something uh, which is better right it's a tough thing to do uh, 
So what can be better than what we are doing today? How can we disrupt ourselves while maintaining the current profitability of the existing business? And even if leaders start asking these questions, which nowadays people have started, leaders have started asking these questions. Uh, and leaders, as they grasp with the risk that they are facing in the markets, uh, large organizations or large parts of these organizations are unable to think on these lines. And when you're unable to see how you can get extinct, there is very little incentive to disrupt what you're, what you're doing uh, or what you've been doing for all these years, especially when what you're doing is profitable. Right? What happens at best in larger organizations, and therein lies the challenge, are small tweaks. What they would do is at best, uh, they will tweak the existing business model, existing product, existing service, and they'll try to better the customer experience, for example, in small steps. And, and, and this is where I would like to call upon Peter Thiel. You know, I don't know if you guys are familiar, but uh, in, in my line of work, where we are investing in early stage companies, he's like a demigod. He was the co-founder of PayPal. And uh, he was also the first investor in Facebook, by the way. So he, he, he was the first guy outside of the Facebook team to put money in that company. Uh, and of course, he made tons and tons of money on that. He invested half a million dollar, half a million dollar. And in seven, eight years, he, uh, when, when Facebook went public, etc., he, he sold his stake for uh, more than a uh, billion dollars. So that's the kind of wealth creation happen, happened for him. Anyway, so one of his concepts that he says, which is very relevant to what we are talking about, is, uh, is, is this disruption and changes, right? Now, he says that when you go from one to, you know, you're at level one. From level one, you will go to level two, level three, level four, level five, you know, level N. When you do that, you are essentially taking small steps and he calls them horizontal changes. So there's nothing major happening. True disruption, and this is all according to him, true disruption is when you go from uh, zero to one, right? Which means there was nothing and now there is something. That is true invention. And that is a kind of breakthrough innovation that creates companies like Google, Amazon, Uber, Netflix, you know, that we've discussed. When a new product or service comes into the world that radically changes the way the whole industry uh, industry was working. So I think, you know, I mean, I can go on and on and on, but I, in the interest of time, I think, let me let me stop here and uh, I will address these points and I have, you know, a few more in the Q&A session as, as we come there. So thanks a lot. Let me hand it back to the, to the coordinator. Thank you, sir, for enlightening us this evening with so many relatable examples. Now we have with us Mr. NMD Shinoy, Director and CEO, Best Fit Business Solutions, Private Limited. Mr. Shinoy is a seasoned banking and information security professional with more than 30 years of experience in the entire banking and financial services and insurance segment. We would request sir to share his views on cyber risk post COVID-19 with all of us. Okay, thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, okay, thanks. So in the next 15 minutes, uh, we'll talk about uh, cyber risks and IT security. So I've got around seven thoughts to be shared with all of you. So what is the World Economic Forum report, then the impact of cyber, then the recent cyber incidents. Just a second. The recent cyber incidents. Then we will also talk about COVID and cyber crime. So the geopolitical situation. Similarly, we will also look at the relation between COVID and cyber crimes, and the need for cyber insurance. And then a quick conclusion. So these are the six things which we are going to discuss. Okay. Now, so all of us are aware of what is called as the Global Risk Report by the World Economic Forum. So year after year, the Global Risk Report is published by the World Economic Forum. So the 16th edition is the 2021 edition. If you look at the various types of risks here, there is something called the technological risk, which is highlighted in Burgundy. So still now in the last three to four years, if you look at it, cybersecurity is one of the top concerns across the globe as well as the various types of technological risk is concerned. So there are two types of technological risk which is highlighted. 
in the 2021 report one is the cyber security failure and second is the digital inequality then we have got obviously because of covid you have got infectious diseases and related to the infectious diseases you have got the livelihood crisis and then the extreme weather, weather events one is natural and one is the sickness related one so this has got a societal influence this is an environmental influence and finally the technological influence so cyber risk is still the top of the mind recall so whenever we are talking about disruptions the moment you talk about technological disruption the concern is also the technological risk which is being brought along with your uh, disruption risk so whenever we talk of uh, cyber risk we talk about confidentiality integrity availability and reputation now if you look at uh, a part of how the what is the impact of cyber on the entire uh, business and economics so if you look at it a trillion dollars have been lost to cyber crime every year this is a report by mcafee and center for strategic and international studies as far as cyber crimes in india is concerned we had 1.25 trillion loss last year alone and if you look at the, the various types of uh, incidents the cyber incidents which keep happening and this is a recent report which was there in the rajya sabha so in the year 2020 alone we had 2.90 lakh cyber security incidents which is approximately 795 incidents per day so on one side you have got uh, disruption you have got new things happening at the same time we also need to be bothered about the type of cyber incidents that is happening in this country as well as globally so if you look at the cyber attack statistics very interesting statistics published by sonic wall in their 2019 trends so you can see that there are top six items one is a ransomware attack one is a malware attack one is the intrusion attempts one is iot malware encrypted threats and your web app attacks you may be seeing that the ransomware attacks have come down by 9% between 18 and 19 but you should not be complacent whenever we look at any statistics we not only look at the percentage part of it we also need to look at the absolute values so if you look at the absolute values of ransomware attack is 187.9 million and 4 trillion is the intrusion attempts so these are some of the things so web app attacks encrypted iot intrusion malware ransomware attack itself can also bring business to a grinding halt and if you look at the cyber attack statistics for 2020 32 percent the malicious threat actor is phishing and social engineering so day in and day out we know that one of the biggest challenges is phishing and social engineering the second is your compromised credential which is 19 percent then you have got vulnerability in third party then you have got cloud misconfiguration and the vulnerability in web application which we already saw so still with all the knowledge with all the factors in place the human chain and the phishing continues to be one big challenge for everybody now let us look at a few incidents which happened in the last year so mitas all of us know so no industry is spared so you have the food industry also you know what is orange burfi given by a company called haldi ram so haldi ram also had a ransomware attack mitas had an attack dr reddy's laboratories had an attack big basket was attacked and there was one more payment uh, aggregator which is uh, your just pay or just pay data leak which also has set rbi thinking and all of us know what is the fire eye attack which happened recently fire eyes itself is a cyber security company so can think of a situation where a company like fireeye which is in the domain of cyber security itself gets hacked and a lot of their tools have been removed similarly now we look at one of the most popular incident which happened in 2020 was the cognizant so cognizant was attacked by a ransomware called maze ransom and it not only affected cognizant it also affected all the companies which were most of the companies which were serviced by cognizant so that was uh, one of the reasons so attack had infiltrated exfiltrated the critical customer data and encrypted the services so the services comes to a grinding halt so with the technology advancement 
as we see disruption in technology their business also can come to a grinding halt with a simple ransomware attack so there is lot of things from a global perspective as far as uh, cyber incidents are concerned and lot of files were stolen as an extortion tactic for threatening public release of the data so there were two things as far as ransomware is concerned when i'll talk about in the next few slides and sensitive personal data ssn tax id financial uh, information drivers license and passport details were stolen of the customer so you can just imagine the complexity of it so if you look at the phase of ransomware the ransomware phase has also changed in covid times in uh, the few years before 2020 whenever there was a ransom attack the ransom attack was to have your availability your hard disk was encrypted or your server uh, disk space was encrypted as a result data was not available you pay the ransom that is it and your data is released that is one way of looking at it in the last year the phase of ransomware has changed is that they steal the data and then they tell if you don't pay the ransom your data will be leaked to the public so the ransomware phase itself has changed and now with uh, covid and things like that whatever we call it as attack surface in earlier days when we had intranet based systems our attack surface was limited slowly we moved on to what is called as intra internet applications the attack surface for the hacker increased exponentially now with covid people started working from home so again there was another exponential growth in the attack surface that is what they call it as boundless points of exposure this is one of the biggest challenges why the cyber crimes have grown exponentially is the effect of the pandemic where people started from working from home now which all sectors were affected by covid that is very interesting so if you look at the sectors which is affected by covid as per the mccafe report you see education tuition collaboration tools all of you would have also heard about uh, zoom bombing okay even the zoom which we are using now was attacked there was something called zoom bombing so education false cv19 financing insurance loans false sanitizers ppe blood cures so healthcare was also badly mauled up because of covid and if you look at the phishing incidents which i told earlier the in march alone there was an 100 500% increase in covid related spam mails in march so whenever you have a mail coming typically what we call technically as a payload so every mail will have a malware as a payload so we had payloads like ursnif covid 19 trickbot emotet azorel remcos rat hansitor nanocore rat netwalker etc so whenever you receive a mail telling covid 19 people go and click it what is it why do people click it so i always give this example of capital market so in capital market if the stock market is going up or going down it is only because of two sentiments hope all of you know which are the two sentiments anybody any thoughts on what are the two sentiments which drive the stock market anybody what are the two sentiments which drive the stock market chennai greed yes. and fear greed, greed and, and fear, fear. yes yeah. yes greed and fear if you look at cyber security also it is the same sentiments which is running the uh, cyber security hackers also why do people click on covid any mail related to covid they are so fearsome they are so anxious what is going to happen and greed you have won a lottery of 1 million pounds give this data give that data so because of this greed and fear also has been exploited very well by the cyber hackers also that is why the 500% increase and if you look at the latest uh, cyber threat which is happening is the corona vaccination registration please register for corona vaccination your time is reduced please share your aadhar number then you share the aadhar number then you get an otp so the latest scam on covid is your covid vaccine so i would suggest all of you not to pray become a prey to all this uh, gimmicks of the cyber scamsters because of greed and fear so eight corona vaccination that want steal money 
as well as personal information, which is the current one. So COVID has brought an up result be mainly because of fear and greed. So if you look at this very interesting part, the fake news is a bigger killer than the virus itself. You will be surprised to know that the social media brought in lot of fake news regarding Corona. And you just look at this article, 600 people in Iran died not because of Corona virus. There was a social media news that drinking neat alcohol will cure you of Corona virus. And people started drinking Corona uh, the neat alcohol and 600 people alone died in Iran. In Bolivia, you will see people buying fa fake and toxic coronavirus cure. So one of the biggest things which happened during the COVID is this fake news. Then the next thought which I want to share with all of you is what is called as cyber insurance. So with the economy moving globally, the next big thing which is going to happen in the market is every organization, just like taking insurance for general insurance for the known perils, like flood, earthquake, etc. Every technology company will have to take what is called as cyber insurance. Now, if you are taking cyber insurance, I have given some companies like Bajaj, HDFC, Tata and Universal. They are the Indian companies. But just be aware by taking an insurance, you cannot be protected. All of us would believe or would have experienced that insurance is a losing game. How many of you agree? How many of you disagree? Whichever way you look at it, it is like the Shole coin. To most of us, insurance taking is like the Shole coin. I don't know whether the new generation knows what is a Shole coin. What is a Shole coin? The new generation. Anybody wants to share their thoughts? Losing on both ends, sir. <laughs> no, no. What is the speciality of the Shole coin? Whatever you choose, you lose. That, that's no, the, both the sides of the coin have only heads. There is no tail. Hmm. Please go and watch the movie. Okay, so if you go and toss a coin, so insurance is always a losing game for many people. Okay, it is not a losing game. Most of the cyber risk can be transferred through liability insurance. Understanding the clauses is important. And what I call it in insurance sector, there is something called a moral hazard. So do you know what is a moral hazard? You buy a car and you go and park your car under a tree which is about to fall. Why do you park? Why do you park a car under a tree which is about to fall? Any thoughts? Because it is insured. Because it is insured, right? Because <laughs> it is insured. Marne do. Gadi ke upar tree girega, to bhi mujhe insurance milega. So that is what is called as a moral hazard. Even an insurance. It can also introduce what is called a moral hazard because you think, okay, I will not put this control. I will not put that control to get your right cyber insure necessary controls are equally important at organization level. So even cyber insurance carries what is called as a moral hazard. And this is also a big business. So when you look at uh, the international business, cyber insurance is going to be the future. And finally, I would like to conclude with a quotation from the Mahabharata. I don't know how many of you know what is called as Yaksha Prasna. There is a very important part in Mahabharata, which is called Yaksha Prasna, where there is a dialogue between a Yaksha who comes in the form of a stork and Yudhishthira. So many of us would be knowing this story. I will not go into that story. So in the Yaksha Prasna, there are around 42, 43 questions, which is asked by the Yaksha to Yudhishthira. So one of the questions was asked in this was, what is wonder? Kim Ascharyam. So Yudhishthira answers, what is wonder? Day after and uh, day after day. Ahani Ahani Bhutani Gachanti Yamalayam. Sheshaha Stavaram Ichanti Kim Ascharyam Atatparam. So day in and day out, you see uh, people going to the house of Yama, but the remaining people think that they are going to be, they are immortal and then they are going to live forever. So when I talk to my CISOs and cybersecurity professionals, I change that statement to telling it day in and day out, you see cyber attacks happen left, right and center. Yet the management or the board thinks that we are not going to be attacked. Oh Lord, what can be a bigger wonder than this? So cyber attack is a reality. You do not know when you are going to get attacked. 
the i would also like to quote one proverb which all organizations have to be very aware of we do not know when the greatness lies not in never falling but rising every time you fall so organization should be prepared for a cyber attack how fast you respond how quickly you respond to the cyber attack is more important because despite putting n number of n controls every day new vulnerabilities come in like zero day attacks new techniques new ransomware so it is next to impossible to control a cyber attack all that you need is how resilient you are and how do you come out of a cyber attack that is why the regulators across the globe have given certain guidelines telling you should have a cyber security policy you should have a cyber crisis management plan which is applicable not only to private enterprises but also to governments as well so you should have the summary is that we need to have a robust cyber crisis management plan be it in whichever industry you are working with this few thoughts i would like to thank and take any questions for the next 2 minutes sure sir we have a q and a round in the end and okay fine in the end to have some questions okay fine no problem okay i am on time thank you once again asha and your team for inviting me for this thank you thank you sir as mentioned by mr shinoy greed and fear has no doubt been the root of cyber attacks thank you sir that was a very informative discussion giving us an overall idea about the cyber risk post covid 19 also giving us some tips on how to be prepared for the same with this we move on to yet another promising session by dr usha nayar raikhat she is a phd economics from cranell graduate school of management purdue university her research revolves around firm strategies related to innovation globalization of r&d trade foreign direct investments technology licensing and acquisition and environmental regulations and their impact on firm strategy we request ma'am to share her views with us on the topic competition and firm level innovation in developing economies along with her co-authors mr thomas brodsky dorota kyolik Jakub Michael Kwiatkowski all from University of Dansk in Poland um just give me one minute please i'm trying to get my um video here i'm having a little bit of problem sure ma'am Not sure why this. Just give me one sec. Okay, maybe this will work. Um. Why am I not able to? Okay. Uh, can you see me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's good. I'm sorry. It's, it was not clear to me why I was not able to get the video on, but um, let me just share my screen with you. um good morning and um i want to thank um dr asha prasuna and um her colleagues for inviting me to this um conference um i'm very delighted to be here um and i want to thank everybody for uh you know it's early morning for me so it's easy for me to get up and uh you know 
uh, get ready for the presentation, but I realize that it's very late uh, in Bombay. And uh, so thank you all for, uh, you know, uh, having this late session so we can uh, also join in. Uh, it has been really a pleasure to work with um, Dr. Uh, Asha and uh, the rest of her colleagues. Um, I've been there a couple of times and it's really been a pleasure. So today what I want to talk about is um, competition and firm level innovation in developing countries. So um, by training, I you know, received my PhD from Purdue University in Indiana and uh, my training is as a trade economist. Um, but of course, you know, coming from India, I was always interested in economic development and um, innovation, you know, uh, is uh, very important for economic development and uh, my trade and innovation and development interests kind of got linked together. And so I, you know, moved. Um, so I find that, you know, um, there's a lot of overlap in those areas and my research has uh, moved in that direction. So part of this research um, was motivated by um, my collaboration with the University of Gdansk in Poland. And um, I wanna thank the Polish Science Foundation for uh, providing us with funding uh, to investigate the intensity of uh, competitive rivalry and innovation, innovative behavior of enterprises. That is a Polish grant which allowed us to start this big project. So we started with our um, work in Poland, which is ongoing. And uh, now we are moving to uh, work in India and other developing countries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about um, India and uh, innovation. We have a lot to be proud of. Uh, and then I'm going to um, talk a little bit about why the results of the research from developed countries may not be exactly applicable to developing countries. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, Polish project and the results we have from it and uh, you know, what we plan to do with our uh, project um, relating to India. Okay. So, um, just put this away. Yes. Um, so, you know, India it has emerged as a regional leader in innovation. So if you look at the 2019 Global Innovation Index, it identifies India as one of the top five innovation economies in Central and Southern Asia. And uh, to quote the World Intellectual Property Organization Director, uh, General Francis Gurry, um, the Global Innovation Index shows us that countries that prioritize innovation in their policies have seen significant increases in their rankings. The rise in the Global Innovation Index by economic powerhouses like China and India have trans transformed the geography of innovation, and this reflects the deliberate policy action to promote innovation. So what um, our project and our thinking as a whole on this has been that um, you know there is a lot of heterogeneity across countries. Um, and so we need to think about what innovation policy should be, uh, you know, what should we take into consideration as we formulate innovation policy, um, especially in developing countries. A lot of the research is on developed countries and so um, we can't, you know, just translate that. Oh, let me start, let me, I haven't started the slideshow. Sorry about that. So India, this is the overall ranking of India in the seven uh, global innovation index areas. So India, the, you know, the highest possible ranking for each of these pillars is one. So India has done very well on knowledge and technology outputs. Um, it's done very well on market sophistication uh, and it's ranked 52nd in the Global Innovation Index, 2019 Innovation Index. Its rank has steadily been increasing over the years. Uh, and you'll see where we have challenges is in the area of infrastructure. 
Um, so, um, you know, I provided this, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if we can go here, if we can, that would be great. So if we look at the, um, globe, uh, the global leaders in innovation, um, let me see if we can make this smaller. So, so if we look at these um, five innovation economies by region, what we are going to see is that in Central and Southern Asia here, uh, India is one of the five leading economies. Um, and that in, uh, you know, the lower middle income uh, countries, India is one among the top five innovators. And then if you look at the, um, you know, um, the WIPO um, says that a healthy global innovation ecosystem draws from everywhere. And so it looks at the different dimensions of the global innovation index, um, it, you know, um, the ones we saw in the graph. And uh, what we see here is that um, India is one of the leaders in the world in, um, in terms of uh, knowledge and technology outputs. So what is the Global uh, Innovation Index? Uh, it ranks um, economies based on 80 indicators. So there are traditional research measures like R&D investments and patents, but also new indicators such as mobile app, mobile phone app creation and high-tech exports. So it also looks at the economic context and one is the pressures from trade disruption and protectionism, which as you know, has um, you know uh, increased tremendously over the last for four years or so. Um, and so um, WIPO suggests that sound government planning for innovation is critical for success. And of course, um, you know, um, we have had to face the challenges of COVID-19. It has far reaching consequences, um, you know, long term, even long term consequences for the global economy and innovation. But at the same time, it has been a strong driver of creativity and innovation at several levels. Um, there is, you know, the creativity and innovation in the fight against COVID itself. Um, and the dramatically shortened timeline to bring um, COVID-19 vaccines to the market, that's unprecedented. And, uh, you know, uh, They've been, there's been, um, people have been, uh, you know, stuck at home. Um, working conditions have changed dramatically. Um, many of us are working at home. I'm teaching from home um, online. And so, you know, there's been, uh, you know, a digital transformation. There's been many different kinds of social innovations, entrepreneurship. Um, there've been worries about mental health, the psychological impact. So, um, you know, this is an opportunity to take the lessons that we've learned from in, uh, our COVID experience and how we had to adjust uh, in a dramatically short period of time. How can we take these lessons uh, learned to strengthen innovation? Those are some of the questions that we can ask ourselves. But, you know, the, um, when we look at traditional economic theory, you know, um, there's either Schumpeter, we're looking at competition and innovation, um, focusing on the protectionism that has, uh, that has increased in the global economy. And there's either a negative relationship as predicted by uh, Schumpeter or a positive and monotonic relationship arrow. But, um, you know, Edgion and others recently have pointed out to a non-monotonic and a U-shaped relationship. 
um, even for advanced countries, the results are, um, the empirical results are divergent and the results are very limited for developing economies. Um, and so uh, what we want to do is we want to look at the impact of both foreign and uh, domestic competitive pressures. Such studies are very limited. Um, and looking at competition and innovation has significant policy implications for competition policy, for state aid, R&D aid, industrial policy, regional development policies. Um, and so this has been the focus of our um, research for the project in Poland. So some of the other um, research that I have done um, earlier on, um, you know, we looked at uh, the role of incremental innovation in uh, pulp and paper industry uh, with my co-author, Vivek Koshel. And um, so that that's an industry where, um, you know, we're not uh, innovation measured by traditional measures actually understates the innovation that takes place in the economy, uh, in, in the industry, in the firm. Um, I saw this when I, you know, visited several pulp and paper um, uh, firms in um, Finland and in other parts of um, the world. And what we saw was that on the floor, there was a lot of innovation taking place that was incremental. And so we um, quantify that incremental innovation and found that it has a huge impact, uh, you know, cumulatively uh, more than 10% um, uh, gains from taking that into account and being cognizant of the role of in, uh, incremental innovation. Um, so what is in the Polish example, you know, the broad questions we are trying to look at is what is the relationship between domestic competition and firms innovative activities and between international competition and firms innovative activities? What's the shape of the relationship? Is it an inverted U? Is it a U-shaped relationship? or uh, something else? And what are some of the factors that mediate the relationship between import competition and innovation? So does the relationship differ for, um, you know, um, what we, cl we classify industries as um, neck and neck and step by step, which I'll describe in a couple of minutes. We also look at the technological sophistication and the degree of internationalization. Um, so if you see, uh, you know, um, in Poland, you'll see that um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of differences among uh, industries classified at the NACE2 level between 2005 and 2017. Um, so there's a great deal of heterogeneity in import competition. Um, so we use, um, you know, um, data from the InfoCredit from the Polish Patent Office. We also do a survey of Polish firms. So let me just discuss our measures for innovation. One is the patents, trademarks, and other intellectual properties. The other, we looked at the total um, factor productivity. And one of, because one of the reasons with the patents um, and R&D data for most developing countries is there's a very low level of patenting. Some firms, they don't, want, they don't patent their in inventions at all. Uh, some of them find the cost very high. They don't see the value to patenting. And a lot of them are doing what we call incremental innovation in our previous paper on the pulp and paper industry. And that's not patentable. Also, uh, firm level R&D data is not available. We tried our best to get firm level R&D data even in our survey, but very few firms were willing to share that information. Um, we use some measures of um, domestic market competition, like the uh, four firm concentration ratio or the um, Herfindahl Hirschman index. Now, um, this is an important classification. We, uh, you know, similar to Agion, um, we look at the neck and neck and step by step industries or sectors. So, um, in the neck and neck sectors, uh, you know, um, competition is, um, um, let me I'll just start, start with explaining this. We calculate the total factor productivity 
And then we, um, where the average technology gap in a particular industry is greater than or equal to the mean technology um, gap in the manufacturing sector as a whole, we call that a step-by-step -step sector. So the technology, uh, you know, and where the average technology gap is less than the mean technology gap in the manufacturing sector as a whole, um, you know, we call that a neck and neck sector. So there the competition is, um, you know, um, firms are pretty close to each other. Whereas um, in the step-by-step -step sector, they are further away from the, uh, many firms are further away from the technology frontier. So, uh, you know, there'll always be some firms which are in the neck and neck sector competing, you know, fiercely the others, you know, there'll always be uh, other firms, other sectors would be the SPS sector, step-by-step -step sector. And the nature of competition and in industry could change over time. And so we perform this classification separately for each year. So we want to see whether, depending upon the type of, um, whether it's neck and neck competition or step-by-step -step competition, whether innovation, whether the impact on innovation is different. And we also classify firms into high-tech, medium-tech, medium-low-tech and low-tech. And the degree of internationalization is exporters and importers, simultaneous exporters and importers and domestic firms. And then we calculate a TFP gap, which is how, how far the firm is from the industry leader. So um, we estimate this equation where innovation stands for either the IPRs or the uh, total factor productivity of the firm. Uh, and we include variables such as um, competition, the age of the firm, import penetration, um, uh, whether the firm belongs to a group, um, region fixed effects, industry fixed effects, and year fixed effects. So the esti we use estimation methods which are uh, you know, uh, accepted in the literature. There are a lot of zeros for patents. And so we do uh, zero inflated negative binomial regression for the IPRs. And for the total factor productivity um, equation, we use the least squared dummy variables. So um, I'm just gonna go through the main results quickly. What we find is that our base IPR uh, model cannot confirm the existence of a nonlinear inverted U relationship between innovation and domestic competition. So right off the bat, our results are not consistent with the results from EGEON, which is uh, you know, a very famous paper in this area. Uh, for developed economies. Um, so um, import penetration has a positive and significant coefficient. So import, uh, so, and it indicates that Polish firms in the SPS sector, step-by-step -step sector, they are, who are facing import competition, they increase their innovative activities. Um, but in comparison to the neck and neck sector, the SBS sector firms have a lower innovation efficiency. Um, you know, there've been, um, there's been another paper that has shown that NAN, uh, NAN, uh, neck and neck firms are more efficient innovators. Um, but as compared to uh, NAN industries, as the intensity of import competition in the SBS industries increases, the firms in the SBS industries are innovating more. And this result is holding both for IPR and TFP models. So we see right off the bat that there is heterogeneity between um, NAN industries and SBS industries. And as compared to the low tech category, being in the high tech and medium tech categories are uh, increase innovation by Polish firms, um, but greater import competition reduces the innovative activities of firms in high and medium tech categories as compared to the low tech industries. And we also find older Polish firms innovate less and that larger firms innovate more than their smaller counterparts. So what we see here is that there is a lot of heterogeneity along various dimensions, age, um, size of the firm, um, the technology categories, 
whether, um, whether they belong to the neck and neck sector or the step-by-step -step sector. When we look at TFP as a dependent variable, we see that um, um, the overall impact of the increased foreign competition on innovativeness is negative. And there, now there is some evidence in the import competition um, to show that there's a nonlinear new shape relationship. So at higher levels of import competition, manufacturing firms in Poland innovate more. Excuse me, I want to drink of water. And there's heterogeneity in the impact of import competition on the productivity of firms, depending on the technology category. Pardon? Pardon? Hello? And the medium sector in Poland. So there's a reason for this. Um, compared to low tech firms, high and medium tech firms innovate more in response to increased um, import competition while medium tech firms innovate less. This could be because they receive more foreign direct investment and so they have less uh, competitive pressure. Um, and um, import competition has a negative and significant impact on innovation for firms in all of the four internationalization categories, exporters, importers, simultaneous exporters and importers and purely domestic firms. Um, oh, and the magnitude and the magnitude of impact is highest for firms that are only either exporters or importers. And of course, these results could be because of some unique characteristics of the Polish economy, lower quality of comp and composition of Polish exports, um, you know, lower value of exports and less number of trading partners. Uh, limits on their ability to respond to the adverse effects of import competition on their innovative abilities, because firms may not perceive the potential return from innovation to be high. And certain sectors have higher level of FDI as compared to other sectors. So what are the conclusions? There are imp important implications for innovation and competition policy in Poland and other developing countries. So based on the experience so results based on the experiences of developed countries may not readily be applicable when examining the relationship between innovation and domestic competition in developing countries. So it's important to consider the heterogeneous impacts of competition on innovation activities on different categories of firms as we design policy. And uh, now this is a work in progress where we are moving on to looking at um, Indian firms and also looking at uh, the role of state aid um, and foreign direct investment on innovation in both Poland and in India. With that, I'm going to stop sharing the screen and, um, um, you know, you said there are questions at the end, right? So um, thank you very much.